and uh, i think it's been quite a transformation having seen the digital version so i think it's i'm just curious to know how this journey began and how did you get here okay first of all thank you very much for staying thank you for coming and watching the show um it's uh, something that uh, came out of a lot of boredom and being at home and uh, the last year <laughs> so the journey really is um Nine years long, we started uh, Ram and I, who's my partner, and uh, somebody I've collaborated for, uh, collaborated with now for 15 years, 16 years, can't remember. <laughs> But uh, um, this show sort of started developing uh, in 2011. I was doing my masters in in London, and I was really looking to see if we could develop material for performance from the actor's body, the craft of voice. Um, Uh, you know, the actor's imagination, experience, and so on. Um, Ram is a playwright, so I have had the you know wonderful fortune of working with someone like him to develop the text. Um, but it really did come out from um, playing around with what is called the actor's craft. Um, in during the pandemic, that was in 2000, uh, you know, last year 21. Um, um, I think there were themes in the piece that uh, called back, especially themes of isolation, of being locked up in one space, not having contact with anybody else. Those were, um, and and this idea of just being on Zoom and seeing your own image play back at you. So those were the things that sort of like, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, triggered that reopening of the text after nine years. So. Yeah, so here we are with this new, yeah. completely new production. By the way, completely new. Yeah, yeah, I do recall <laughs> these sets in London were so different, and the characters could never overlap. But it's, I think, a very interesting piece of uh, how you brought all of this out in a digital media. But uh, I think when I watched it, and having watched it, I think three to four times now, there is just so much in the script, and there's so many themes and concepts and texts. So you obviously have your four key characters and. a lot of it is about how they move in and out of their moments uh, i don't know, i just wanted you to you know maybe spend a little bit more time on how you got to the theme how do you do, how did you develop the story and you know what drove most of this narrative because there's just so much happening okay i'm going to try to do this really quickly <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah we are dealing with a, uh, quite a few themes in the in the text and if there's any curiosity in the audience uh, if you pick up something that you know you want to ask about then i'm happy to look at that but uh, essentially uh, well i i don't want to sort of like lock it into some kind of specific thing i i really like it open as an experience of performance and uh, it's it, i don't i don't want to say this these are the themes that we were working with but rather um, keep it open but will offer two two or three ideas one is that uh, i was looking at uh, moments in my own life when i i reached crossroads and you know there was a possibility to go in any direction and that moment of suspension where um you're considering the infinite possibilities that are in front of you and they uh, some of that some of those themes clearly uh, you can you can see them and you can re- you, you hear them in the piece um Uh, when ram and i started working on it we had a sense of the four characters or we had a sense of the three characters yeah. the fourth so character the is uh, the, the mailer demon. demon who sort of like appeared as a device and uh, we realized that it was uh, such a such an important part of the piece um uh, uh the first character is of course the girl in the apartment who appeared sometime in 2007 when um around the time just before the time ram and i met and uh, uh, that first scene was sort of written in and uh, i was of course looking at at a moment in uh, our history in the city about uh, you know um there were a lot of us who were falling off um jobs you know there was a period of time when about some of us in our 30s and late 30s early the- 40s when you just disappearing from social media disappear disappearing from uh, you know uh, connections with friends 
and uh, you'd suddenly hear uh, news that you know the person had just passed away and you you didn't know what was it that uh, got them from being um, you know completely visible either on social media or some kind of network and then suddenly disappearing and then finding out that they'd gone you know so those were uh, some of the themes that um, intrigued me personally um, so yeah I mean the other themes I think um, I, I, I would like to sort of like hear from the rest of you if there's something that you know has caught your attention then I'm happy to elaborate on that but yeah, there are, there are many themes there. I, I don't know which one. I think particularly one thing that caught my eye definitely in, in this version was the whole Zen Kwan style of conversation that was used. Also, I think the way that you've used cameras, lenses, angles and so much uh, in digital format, which is very different also from the thing. So do you want to like touch upon you know the, the story? I know, Ram, you've written quite a bit of the script, but it's just, I'm just curious to know how that weaved its way into, it's quite visible uh, throughout yeah. the play. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually going to invite Ram to talk about the Kwans. Um, I think as Ram makes his way or to the mic or the mic makes his, its way to Ram, I'll just say a couple of things that the piece, uh, the, perf the, the script and the shape of the performance uh, sort of is, is informed by two, um, two ideas, let's say. Uh, one is the journeys of the women. Um, and they could, they are, happen to be women, but they, you know, they, they could be anybody's journey. Uh, one of the characters spirals downwards and one of them climbs out. One is looping backwards and the male demon is of course in a infinite loop of not ever being able to send across a message no matter how much she wants to. So that's one of the things that informs the shape of the piece, which is kind of fragmentary and it's not in a you know straightforward um, linear storytelling kind of format. And the other thing, and this is where I invite Ram to talk about it, is um, uh, is the Kwans because they are you know unfinished poems, and I'll leave that for Ram to say more about it. Thank, thanks, Malika. I'll, I'll just chip in with. Um, I'm just going to take the liberty of just speaking from the, <laughs> from the back here. Um, <laughs> is um, I, I think around 2010 we were engaging with um, the breath patterns in Kudiyatta um, and the sort of uh, the rasa and the, the, the way of sort of creating emotional states using the breath. And I became interested in a parallel way um, with the martial arts which were similarly embodying kind of aspects of consciousness. Um, so one of the images that Malika had, had brought very strongly to the process was the image of this Hindu Buddhist goddess, the Chinnamasta. So she's sort of an enigmatic figure, sort of decapitated, uh, self-decapitated goddess. <laughs> and so uh, that's not easy material to work with, right? <laughs> so you you know, make a play about a decapitated self, uh, a self-decapitated self -decapitated goddess. That's a mouthful in of itself. Um, so one, one of the things that popped up for me was the Japanese idea of the mind of no mind. So. Um, I was reading, as any good student of the martial arts would, uh, Takwan Soho. It's like one of those required readings for martial artists. Um, and he, there was this, these beautiful Kwans in there that just sort of stuck in the piece. And they were very much a part of the stage version. And I think in this round, we thought, let's take it a little further and let's try to mimic or at least uh, show the Kwan in action, right? And it's sort of incomplete. Uh, and Kwans are befuddling and they're riddles in that sense. And they ask you to go to a higher state of consciousness to kind of really get, or at least begin to pick away at what the Kwan is. Um, so that was the idea and we sort of ran it in the piece. And uh, um, I, great, I, I mean, very ironically, one of those central Kwans actually fell away from this version, which actually we had held on uh, to quite dearly. Um, but I, I mean, I would encourage you to read Takwan so <laughs> for, the, for the deep engagement of the Kwans. Um, but I was amazed at how Malika embodied many of those states with breath. And I think breath was something that was, was uh, a central um, theme working through the piece. Right. Thank you. you uh, Ram wrote some of the Kwans. <laughs> so they're not all Takwan Soho's Kwans. Some of them are his original Kwans. <laughs> right. So yeah. I think uh, I work with mental health. And one of the most 
underlying theme and concepts that I found at least intriguing was that each of your characters had lots going on in their minds. They were having conversations. They were breaking out. Some dealt with it. I felt like I could see anxiety, panic, ecstasy, a whole raft of emotions. And I think anybody and everybody in the room could relate to moments in the story. Uh, but I wanted to kind of touch upon that whole fact about, you know, how did you want to embody the whole mental health, mental health piece? And then maybe we can touch upon how art could maybe impact that state that, you know, all of us are seeing. And I, I think COVID was even more, uh, it was clearer in COVID that a lot of us were feeling lonely, we were feeling disconnected, and maybe just a voice, maybe a response from male or demon could have changed our lives, right? So I ran a suicide helpline for a number of days, and it's shocking to see how many calls actually came. Uh, and that one conversation could change the outcome of somebody's life. Uh, and that to me was my takeaway, at least, when I looked at it, which is that something can change that outcome for you in your life. Uh, so just wanted you to elaborate a little bit. And I know that you're doing some work Gosh. in this space. So Gosh, thank you. Thank you, Mita. I mean, that is not a way I'd, I would have thought of it, but thank you very much for that offer. Um, so a couple of things. I, uh, I think it's not an offer for a possible path to take, but it certainly is something to do with empathy. Uh, it certainly has something to do with being able to talk about it or reflect on it in a dignified sort of manner. Um, we've, we've, uh, I mean, we've all had some experience of uh, mental health, illness, well-being, uh, either in our own lives, many times in our own lives, and many times in very close uh, quarters within our friend circles and our family <coughs> as well. So just this uh, notion of being able to um, talk about it in a way that uh, allows people to engage with it empathetically. I think that's that's really was the thing that drove um, to shape these characters in the way that we have done. Uh, that's one thing. And the second thing is, I think, during the pandemic, of course, and, and even otherwise, I think there's a great sense of um, your self being um, um, something that's out there in terms of images, in terms of how your what your person is or yourself is, uh, in terms of either in social media or else. So this, uh, you know, this notion of reality, uh, what is real, was something that uh, became very important uh, to investigate for me as a performer, who's who's most of my training is on the stage with a live audience like this. Um, presence is something that I deal with and train in all the time. And in this moment, it became quite interesting to see how it was, how we could use bodily sensations, breath, and just voice to root or ground this anxiety that, you know, as a, as a world we were experiencing, we were experiencing it together. So, um, those were some of the questions that um, brought me to this piece in this moment. Uh, also, I was teaching a lot. I, I teach voice, and I, I was teaching voice uh, online right through the two years. And uh, as Mita is saying, that, that just those few minutes of being with someone, even if it was uh, you know, on a, in a digital space, but being in the, um, in the same room with someone else who you could look at and see their faces, hear their voices, became uh, a, you know, a, a kind of a, how shall I say, a safe room to sort of like land into, you know, because there was just so much else that was going on. Um, one was not able to process everything, digest everything. I think that's going to be a long process anyway. But that idea really, um, in terms of to address what uh, Mita is saying, is what, what can we do as artists? I think that's an interesting question because as an actor, I'm really, um, as any actor actually, and many times people who are in performance, I'm using the word actor because I'm an actor, but otherwise I, I think we all train in this um, human empathy, you know, we sort of like spend years uh, training in it. So this is something that is easily uh, experienceable and uh, something that we can teach one another even though we're not in the same 
uh, field. And it really has to do with uh, connecting with senses, your breathing, a sense of reality of ground, uh, you know, of gravity, <laughs> these kinds of things. So I find that these are um, very useful ways in which we could think of ourselves as artists and what we have to share outwards. I mean, this is, uh, this is all I have to offer, really. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's proven in mental health science that awareness, voice, senses, all of that, just being aware of it can transform it. And I do know that you probably do run some workshops yes, uh, thank you. around it <laughs> as well. So, thank you. Thank uh, you, Vita. I think I'd like to also ask the audience if you have any questions for Malika or Ram uh, for today. Mm -hmm. Or any comments even. <laughs> All of them, I think. All of them. I mean, apart from that being part of my job description, as to when I go into a play, it's my job to find ways to connect with that character. But these, these, uh, let me say, let me say it a slightly different way. This particular piece is really about my working with the craft of an actor. So I, I was really pulling uh, or mining my own experiences, my own life, in some ways to uh, flesh out some of these characters. But, you know, uh, that stops very quickly in the process of something creative, you know. It, uh, uh, the personal um, elements that you bring into a character sort of fall away very quickly, and then it begins to sort of resonate with anybody in the audience. So I, I would imagine, um, for me, all the, all the characters are very close, and I, feel, I felt them quite close to me. I, I, I would be interested in asking you, though, as to what character would you have felt closest to? I, I related to the emotional aspects of all the characters. Again, uh, no, that's fine. Um, but no, I just wanted to ask whom you felt the closest to while acting, because it's different while acting it on stage and, you know, like you said, while shooting it for like a digital uh, aspect. So. Yeah. Okay, let me take that question and move it closer to something that Meeta also asked about the camera lenses and things like that. So, uh, one of the challenges that I was facing was really how does one create a theatrical experience, which is a physical experience most times. I mean, like that's what we like to say is that's, that's theater. I don't believe that. But, you know, that's something that uh, we want to... Um, um, definitely explore. So uh, to me, this notion of being able to use the camera the way it felt real in that time, as well as um, taking into consideration what the camera can do, you know, because uh, on stage, for example, I don't need anything more than just the words that the writer has given me to create or paint the picture of the Himalayas, you know, but as soon as I have a camera, then I have to deal with the fact that the camera captures everything and lays you bare and naked, you know? So if I don't have the Himalayas actually behind me, uh, it's going to be quite difficult unless, you know, there's some thought that has gone into it in terms of how are we going to create that inside the mind of the person who's watching, you know? and still be able to use the camera. So for me, those, uh, those moments were very interesting. So each character has a certain kind of lens attached to her. Um, for example, the phone is very close to the woman in the red room, and the laptop is uh, you know, for the, for the uh, woman in the apartment. And that uh, GoPro, I mean, I've, I've used sort of like four, four lenses in the piece. I've used a, uh, a webcam, I've used a phone, camera, I've used a GoPro lens, uh, a camera, and, and a proper uh, <laughs> Sony uh, camera, which does the, you know, the cabaret thing. So each of those have, has a reasoning behind it. Um, and uh, this idea of having one camera just looking at you without your permission um, makes this space a little more oppressive and claustrophobic, almost as if somebody was watching you uh, voyeuristically and you know stealing your image without your permission so so those are some of the things that um, was interesting as a person who's directing the piece um, but I think 
each, I mean, I, I, I can't decide which one I was closest to. I kind of like them all. Yes, <laughs> thank you for answering. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning his name in, in this room. Yeah. <laughs> Big fans. Yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, it was absolutely brilliant and riveting. Thank you. And what I take away from this performance or this piece that you've made is that as an actor, you did not have any really props or any body language except your face. And in, that, in, in the face also, you have eyes, you have a mouth, you have your forehead, you have your cheeks. And I think that not even 1% of the screen time do your hands come into the frame or anything like that. So to be able to take an audience with you from a closed room to a snowstorm to a train was a journey, you know. I think that it is a real takeaway for me as an uh, observing you as an act, actor, which I've done before also, you know, is uh, just absolutely fantastic that given nothing and that just your face can do all these things and take you on a journey which is absolutely out of this world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Navroz. <laughs> what, um, um, I, I just want to say thank you very much. I mean, this is my first ever piece that I've worked with uh, cameras on my own. Navroz is a very, very celebrated and well-known cinematographer and I've worked with him on a film myself. So, great honor. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a mic right there. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so I noticed in three of the stories, like, you know, the silence which these women were experiencing was uh, parallelly juxtaposed with the noise. So you had Shiva as the noise. There was the noise of all the trucks and everything which was being discussed there. And then, of course, the noise of the party. So I think, it, was it intentional? Was it uh, just f fell into place because the script demanded it? Mm. Curious. Gosh, I'm so tempted to keep that mysterious. <laughs> 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 so, so some of, uh, I mean, Shiva's noise is of course, uh, you know, is part of the script and very much part of the uh, piece. Um, I have to say, we had a very small unit. We were three of us in a room at any given time. I was offered this beautiful white uh, art gallery by a friend and let, who let me use it for like two months. You know, so I had that kind of luxury and we would go in in the night, just at the time of lockdown, spend the night there. And when the lockdown was lifted, we'd get up in the morning and come back. So that's, um, and we didn't have much equipment. As I said, we had these, three, these four cameras and one mic. So much of the recording is uh, quite live and f either on the phone, it's either on the uh, you know, mic that's on your laptop. And some of it does pick up the ambience, even though we were shooting um, through the night. There were this or, uh, you know, truck or this auto that would pass by. So we couldn't do anything about it. So it is actually quite raw. It's not a, it's not a uh, you know, it's not been treated as a film as such, you know. Um, also, the scenes are, uh, they play uh, almost like a play would do, you know, an entire scene with very few cuts, and those cuts are also, you can tell when they are. We've made that choice as a, um, it's a, it's a filmic choice when we've made some cuts, and that's because we want it to be like, you know, the PR2 scene has lots of cuts in it, and so on. So, um, <laughs> 
Yeah, so sorry. Yes, some of it is just accidental and we couldn't remove it. Uh, so it's there. Um, but some, some of them, um, in fact, were quite uh, uh, magical because some of the sounds that just sort of like uh, created the landscape, uh, sorry, the soundscape for us, sim just, it just happened that sometimes, you know, it worked. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have two questions to you. One word, audience to kind of feed off in terms of energy. But here the journey is quite lonely, so how is the difference? Mm, thank you for that recognition. It is terribly lonely. Um, hmm. Um, let me uh, let me give you a f f fun uh, instance first, okay? So the, the, the very first time we screened this, uh, I was sort of, uh, we, we finished editing in about like 48 hours, something like that. We shot across five days, six days, and then we edited it, you know, very, very quickly. And then it uh, we had a screening on Insider because we didn't have too many platforms for screening uh, performances at that time. So there was Insider and later on Book My Show sort of came in. So at that time, uh, for the very first show, uh, we were really excited because we the audience would actually come into the uh, virtual room and we got locked out of it. So it was like uh, if you had... If I had a show in Ranga Shankara and the show was starting at 7.30 and the doors were closed and I was outside, it was exactly the same feeling. I cannot tell you that like somebody uh, gratefully had left the window open in the green room or something like that and we climbed into it and came into that virtual room. So in some ways that excitement of uh, having a live audience come in, even though we couldn't see them, uh, I think it was felt. It was, uh, it was really... Um, quite nerve-wracking, uh, that first uh, show. And to see people send up hearts and comments and say hi to each other if they knew each other in the room via chat. Actually, that was an experience I hadn't expected to be so joyous, you know? Even though we were all in completely different spaces, Ram and I sitting in our dark room, desperately trying to get in, finding someone who, you know, was part of Insider and let us in. And, but then, you know, this, the, so, so to that extent, it, it was qu quite similar, okay? Um, the second similarity that I found was that you still have to work with your body. You still have to work with what feels true and authentic um, to you in that moment, you know? And of course, there is this, uh, when I was watching it today, of course, there's like uh, my own performances, you know, it happens. But the, the sense of time, for example, uh, uh, that it, scene takes on stage is very different from the time, uh, cinema time or camera time, you know. And to try and negotiate that, there's always something that you lose or something that you gain from it, you know. Um, so for example, if, if this was a film, I would kill myself and say this is way too long. You know, I, I, I won't kill myself. But what I mean, do you, 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 you understand what I'm trying to say. So the medium is different and there's a sensibility of time that is different. Um, but the rehearsal time, for example, what I would take four weeks to eight weeks to make a piece if I was uh, going to stage it, it was no different. It took me that much time anyway. And we had to collaborate. We had to find schedules, times, people dropping out, coming back, people getting COVID, all sorts of things. All of the, that happened. So in that sense, I, I feel that a creative process doesn't lose anything because it's digital. You know, that was my experience, and that's what I want to offer. My second question being, uh, this is called hybrid theater. So how, and this is a piece based on theater while still being theater. Okay, I'm going to be provocative and ask you, what do you mean by theater? Um, but, but, okay, uh, let me not go there. But le let me just say that, um, Mm, those lines are blurring, no? As to what is theater, what is digital, what is uh, cinema. No? These, these lines are blurring very nicely now. Um, I think what, is, uh, what was interesting is that 
as, as a theater person, as an, as an artist, or as a person who's like working with actors all the time, one wants to adapt to what is true in the world outside right now, you know? And uh, it, it, there's no uh, puritanical way of looking at, uh, you know, or rather being puritanical about what uh, goes as theater. Theater, in fact, takes from everywhere, <coughs> always, you know, and it's always adapting. So I don't see why this, this, this sudden thing that, you know, theater should be something suddenly appears because, you know, we are, we are going into the digital space. Uh, I, that's my personal opinion, of course, but um, I think it's really about the theatrical experience of uh, what it means to be in a space together and watch, watch a performance. And uh, what I realized is that that space no longer has to be inside an auditorium. That space can be virtual and we can be in different places and still have a shared room where we are together. You know, and this is all your Zoom conferences are happening on that principle all the time anyway. So, In fact, I think coming from the technology world and doing so much in the metaverse, I truly feel there's going to be a day where I can just sit here and actually experience the 360 degree view of a theatre soon and artists will need to adapt to it because Perhaps that's what the experience would demand. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I just came out of a, sh a test of one of our onboarding experiences where we were just sitting, but you would actually feel like you were sitting and observing the room in a 360 degree way. So technology is not far from simulating some of those experiences. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 um, I kind of like uh, um, technology, particularly the kind that Sneha is indicating to me, which is... Time out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I mean, I, I, I'll just say thank you very much for coming here, making the time, sitting through this. Thank you. Thank you.